The most famous, or rather infamous, Southeast Asian crocodile to be found throughout the region, though in much reduced numbers compared to the beginning of the 20th century, is the saltwater or estuarine crocodile, Crocodilus porosus. It is the largest and most dangerous crocodile of the world. Specimens of five or six meters weighing 1,000 kilograms or more, were described in the, 19, <clears throat> in the 1960s, while the older literature mentions even larger ones. Such figures are not necessarily exaggerations. It is a well-known phenomenon that due to hunting pressure, the maximum size of various animals have dropped over the last five or six decades or more. In a publication dating from 1994, the estuarine crocodile was said to kill about a thousand people annually. But this piece of information was undated, and I suspect that it might refer to the 1960s or 70s, <clears throat> when the onslaught of crocs had not yet reached its peak. Biologists are too often inclined to regard this kind of data as constants, which obviates the need to put a date to them. The largest bloodbath caused by estuarine crocodiles in recent history, appears to have occurred in 1945, when, at the end of the Second World War in the Pacific, about 1,000 Japanese soldiers fled for British troops in the Burmese mangrove swamp, where they were all killed by crocodiles during the night, with the exception of 20 people who managed to escape. The saltwater crocodile eats fish, but also mammals, such as water buffalo and humans. It occurs mainly in salt and brackish water, but it is also able to swim far upriver and survive in fresh water conditions. As all crocs, saltwater crocodiles, though basically aquatic animals, are also able to stay on land for quite a while and to walk on the ground, which they can do amazingly rapidly, as many of their terrestrial prey found out to their detriment. The other four kinds of Southeast Asian crocodiles are far more localized, usually endemic species. And with endemic, I mean in the biological sense, that they only occur in, in a certain, in one country, for instance. Um, the first one is the Siamese crocodile, um, which was once found throughout mainland Southeast Asia, but is now almost extinct and confined to a reservoir in the province Nakhon in Thailand. The Philippine crocodile, Um, is a very rare, is very rare. Um, the Philippine crocodile, which was always uh, restricted to the Philippine Islands and therefore an endemic species, is now very rare. Possibly not more than 500 animals and now confined to the island of Mindanao and the Sulu archipelago. The New Guinea crocodile um, is and always has been restricted to New Guinea. Finally, the false gharial or gavial, now also an endangered species, is confined to a few populations on the Malay Peninsula and on the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. These species have in common that they are smaller than the saltwater crocodile, with maximum length of adult males ranging from 2 to 4 or 5 meters. All four species live mainly in freshwater. They have also in common that they do not attack people, at least not in living memory. In the case of the Siamese crocodile, this has not saved him from persecution, as it is often killed because it looks quite like a saltwater one. In January of this year, in Jan January 2007, I visited a crocodile breeding center near Davao, capital of the island of Mindanao, southern Philippines. Here, Attempts are made to keep the rare endemic Philippine crocodile from becoming extinct. Such centers are nowadays to be found in many places. A development that started in the 1970s in New Guinea. Crocodiles will almost certainly never be as popular as our tigers. Even recently hatched crocodiles are not exactly cuddly, snapping as they do with their tiny jaws at everyone from birth. But attempts to help them survive are now undertaken nevertheless. Nowadays, all Southeast Asian crocodiles are listed as endangered species. A crocodile in the wild 
has become a rare sight, and one has to travel to remote areas for a glimpse of one. However, some hundred years ago, and in many areas even 50 years ago, large and potentially dangerous crocodiles were in many coastal uh, regions, thick on the ground, and often regarded as pests that had to be eradicated. It is difficult to believe that in 50 years or so, we have made a quantum leap from widespread fear for the ubiquitous crocodile to energetic attempts to, see, to save the animal from extinction. What happened between 1900 and 2000 with all those crocodiles? I can think of four factors that may have caused the near disappearance of the crocodiles of Southeast Asia. First, governments started to stimulate the killing of these animals by holding out rewards, bounties, for captured or killed crocs. Second, firearms improved considerably and became more widely available to the people of the area, while more European and American hunters shot crocodiles as trophies. Third, hunting of crocodiles for their skins increased considerably during the 20th century, as it became more and more commercially attractive to export these skins to Europe, the US, and later Japan, where it used to be fashionable to have shoes and bags of croc leather. Finally, Owing to high population growth rates in Southeast Asia, the continuous expansion of the area under commercial crops, and the high rates of deforestation from the 1960s, crocodile habitat loss occurred on a very large scale. Thus, crocodiles were not only killed in large numbers, the ecological niches they needed for reproduction and survival were slowly but surely disappearing. Throughout a period, of a strong European presence in Southeast Asia from the 16th century to the years after sec the Second World War. Crocodiles, together with tigers and venomous snakes, had in the eyes of the foreign visitors symbolized the dangers of Oriental nature. European residents and visitors reported about the large numbers of crocodiles to be found in the region and about their aggressiveness. For instance, um, around 1900, the numbers of crocodiles were so high at the confluence of the Ongak and Dumoga rivers on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia, that it was impossible to cross from one bank to another, while nearby villages were surrounded by bamboo stake fences to protect the inhabitants at night. European observers also reported that many people in the region refused to go, off, to go after and kill those monsters. They commented upon the special relationship that appeared to exist between crocodiles and humans as amazed and usually incredulous about these links, as was their readership, the public back home in Europe and later in the United States. That these stories were not figments of imagination, Orientalist dreams generated by one of the many fevers that, were often, that they were often subject to, can be established if one looks at anthropological fieldwork carried out over the last decades, which largely confirms the stories of the European civil servants, soldiers, sailors, and missionaries of the past. In this, in this talk, I look in more detail at this special relationship. Most of my material comes from what is now Indonesia, a region for which I collected data regarding the years between 1600 and 2000. One of the oldest references at my disposal is that of a German soldier, Kaspar Schmalkalden, in the service of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, who visited various areas in Asia between 1623 and 1627. Schmalkalden's soldiering took him to Chirbon, a small sultanate on the north coast of Western Java, just to the east of what is now the city of Jakarta. He tells us that the Sultan of Chirbon had a subject who called himself a master in the black arts, and who was regarded by the Javanese as a man who could work miracles. It was said that he was able to summon from the depth the crocodile that had attacked the horse of the governor general of the VOC with powerful incantations in order to have the governor general meet out the punishment it deserved. Schmalkalden was obviously talking about what we might wish to call a crocodile charmer. The Danish adventurer Jörg Andersen visited the central Japanese state of Mataram in 1646. The Sultan of Mataram had a large pond in a walled-in courtyard in which he kept a crocodile as an executioner for criminals. 
During Anderson's stay in the capital, a thief was taken to the courtyard where one of the Muslim clerics, by means of incantations, called the crocodile out of the water. The croc grabbed the thief with his jaws and dragged him into the water. Here, then, we see another crocodile charmer at work. In a number of sources of a somewhat later date, we find references to crocodile charmers who punished crocodiles that had devoured human beings. Around 1670, this was reported to take place among the Makassaris of southern Sulawesi. And around 1700, the same thing was observed in Siam, now Thailand, as well. Regarding Siam, it was said that the Menam River, better known nowadays as the Chao Praia, was crawling with crocodiles, mainly to the south of Bangkok, because the Buddhist clergy had forbidden them to swim further upstream. If a crocodile did so nevertheless, and it tore a human being to pieces, it would be caught and punished for its crime by a cleric. Crocodiles were caught using a barking dog, little bells, and a large hook with a piece of bacon. A similar method with dogs and bait and hooks, as bait and hooks, was around that time used in Batavia, the city that is now called Jakarta. The Japanese also caught crocodiles in nets, a much more dangerous method according to the German surgeon Christopher Frieke, who stated that the rivers in and around Batavia were teeming with crocodiles when he was staying there during the 1680s. However, in some sources it is suggested that the crocodile charmers just talked the animals out of the water. Around 1825, the German traveler Pfeiffer zu Neueck came across a crocodile charmer in Krawan, a place between Batavia and Chiribon. This man called and then berated the crocodiles that had behaved badly towards humans and put it to them that they had behaved badly towards, that they had um, behaved dishonorably towards their human relatives, a topic I will deal with presently. The crocodile was told that it would die as punishment for its offense, what always happened at the predicted moment. Pfeiffer assumed that this was done with poison. Apparently, crocodile charmers were supposed to be able to distinguish between a crocodile that had killed a human being and the ones that had not, as the following quotation, referring to the Malay Peninsula and Java around 1900, suggests. The Malayan crocodile wizard is sometimes credited with the power of calling the crocodile folk together and of discovering a man-eater among them. Similar stories of the prowess of crocodile charmers are told by the Javanese. In some areas, one did not have to be able, to, one did not have to be a crocodile charmer to summon a crocodile. In Poso, central Sulawesi, it was believed that people who had a crocodile ancestor could call this animal, provided one knew his name. If one wanted to cross the river, the crocodile would come and would transport his descendant on his back. This was totally safe if the crocodile's jaw was opened, which meant that no one in the family had done him any harm. Crocodile charmers did not only call and punish crocodiles, they could also keep them at bay. This happened to J.A. Stutzer, a Swedish physician who traveled through the Chirbon area in 1786 in the company of an indigenous official. When they had to cross a broad river, the official sent for a crocodile charmer as protection against the many crocs in the river. The crocodile charmer was an old man, head of a village, and of royal blood, hence his title, Raden. Stutzer asked the man to show him how he charmed the crocodile. But he answered that he had not yet seen a guilty one, a one guilty of eating a human or a domestic animal. There was one location in eastern Java, Lake Grati, where the summoning of crocodiles appears to have become a kind of tourist attraction around the 1840s already. An old man living nearby would enter the lake with a small boat to which a little raft carrying a duck was attached. The men would call the croc, saying, come kiai, the term to address a, a revered older person, you have foreign visitors who want to present you with a tasty meal. A few crocodiles would then surface, and one of them would grab the duck, dragging it to the depth of the lake. Originally, it appears to have been a place where indigenous people came to present offerings to the crocodiles, in fulfillment of a vow they had made, thus feeding both the crocodiles and the people who lived close to the lake who had taken it upon themselves to take the offerings to the crocodiles. The crocodiles disappeared from the lake around 1870. 
Although nowadays it is not unusual that army sharpshooters are called in to call a marauding crocodile, spiritual specialists that could be called crocodile charmers are still consulted as well. This is a crocodile charm. Um, for instance, in Borneo, where men-eating crocodiles have not yet disappeared. In some places in New Guinea, however, such specialists appear to be missing, as are the sharpshooter soldiers, and men-eaters can go unchecked for quite some time. But such situations appear to be rare nowadays. Given then that in the past many crocodiles, in all likelihood almost exclusively the Crocodilus porosus, the saltwater crocodile, were dangerous to humans, and that many people in Southeast Asia got killed by crocs, may we assume then that the indigenous population was bent on killing crocodiles systematically? Most sources suggest that this was not the case. The German Johann Wolfgang Haidt in the Indonesian archipelago in the 1730s wrote that the indigenous, the indigenous population did not allow people to hurt crocodiles <clears throat> because they believe that the crocodile will go in pursuit of those who harm them. In order to keep the crocodiles happy, they brought them offerings of rice. The corollary of this was that crocodiles would not harm anyone who had done them no wrong. The English servant of the British East India Company, William Marsden, in Sumatra from the 1780s to the 1810s, confirmed that crocodiles were not harmed by the indigenous population, adding that this was based on, and I quote, a superstitious idea of their sanctity, or perhaps of consang consanguinity, a notion we will explore presently. The sweet Stutze, whom we have met before, was around this time in Java. He agreed that the Japanese regarded the crocodile as a sacred animal to which offerings were made. According to him, only bad crocodiles killed people and domestic animals. The Dutchman Johannes Olivier, a civil servant in the colonial bureaucracy of Java in the 1820s, confirmed that some crocodiles did do no harm, did not do any harm to the indigenous people living near the sea and the rivers, and were used to people leaving food for them at the beach, which they then would pick up. Another Dutchman living in Java around the same time stated that Japanese who jumped into the sea from their boats to drag it ashore or the other way around were never bothered by crocodiles. Therefore, according to yet another Dutch report from those years, in the eyes of the indigenous population, crocodiles should not be harmed. And they were convinced that those who killed a crocodile would meet with an accident or even with death. The German physician Otto Monike worked in Sumatra between 1845 and 1863 and saw much of the land and its inhabitants. He wrote that both the Japanese and the Sumatrans believed that the soul of a departed human being could enter the body of a crocodile. Such crocodiles were not only totally harmless, and I, I quote, but they also protected the inhabitants of the place where they had lived in their former state and where they now prefer to hang out against attacks of other crocodiles. Monica continued, there is no doubt that these animals have, in some cases, not only a particular knowledge of certain local circumstances, but also of individual people whom they will never harm. He himself, the physician Monica, had seen on the island of Banka, of Sumatra's southeast coast, in the village of Kupo, how a number of children were playing between two crocodiles on a riverbank and even rode piggyback on them without any reaction from the crocodiles. The local people had told him that these crocodiles had been in the same spot for years without harming anyone. During this period, no other crocodile had ever grabbed a human being or a domestic animal. Monique also wrote that the indigenous population would only take any action against the crocodile if the latter had grabbed someone who was related to them or a domestic animal then they would have their revenge. A crocodile charmer would be called, well, called in to catch the animal, and when it was caught, the entire population would release their pent-up rage by sticking sharp objects into the animal. Some of us might find Monica's story about children playing with crocodiles difficult to believe. However, the story might become a bit less far-fetched if we take into account that such so-called good crocodiles were regarded as relatives of the villagers. 
they were seen as part of the family in the broad sense of the word, the larger kin group. And they were particularly conceived of as ancestors. In the historical record, we find various ways of expressing this close connection between crocodiles and humans. Although it is not always expressed in terms of real family, as is shown uh, presently. The same theme is found in Southeast Asia in the folk tales. Starting with the, life, the last type of sources, I will now summarize a Burman story from Myanmar. The crocodile, Ngamo Yate, was found when it was still in the egg, crocodiles lay eggs, by a fisherman and his wife, who put the tiny croc that crept out of the egg in a pond, where they brought it up. Soon it had outgrown its abode, and the couple took it to the sea. Here they called it every night from the shore, and it would surface and eat out of their hands. One day, however, it suddenly seized the couple, and while the husband was dying, he prayed for revenge in his next existence, as the Burmese are Buddhists who believe in reincarnation. When the crocodile, crocodiles are known to live to a ripe old age, turned a hundred years, he became a human being. He traveled along the delta of the Irrawaddy River and got married. In the meantime, the old fisherman had been reborn, had found a teacher, and had learned magic, discovering the secret of the magic wand. He then went to the bank of the stream, which today bears Nga Moyet's name, hits the water three times with his magic wand, commanding the crocodile to come to him. The crocodile heard the call, took his leave from his wife and son, presumably reassumed the croc shape, came and died at the magician's feet. That part of the crocodile that was still in the water turned into rubies. The part that was already on the riverbank turned to gold. Its human wife then built on that spot a pagoda in its memory. In this story, we find three or four themes that are, uh, that are of interest to us when exploring the close connection between humans and crocodiles. In the first place, the crocodile is in fact adopted into a human family and fed and cared for by his human parents. Second, it turns into a human being but is apparently also able to revert to its animal shape. In other words, this croc is a were-crocodile, just as there are supposed to be werewolves, and I might add, were-tigers. This appears to be a theme that is found throughout Southeast Asia. Finally, crocodiles turn humans, marry humans, and beget children. However, the crocodile betrays his ad adoptive family, who are then entitled to revenge. If we look at the dateable historical record, the first European source that refers to family relations between humans and crocodiles is dated around 1770. It was written by one of the participants in Captain James Cook's voyages, John Hawkesworth. He was told that various Indonesian peoples believed that women who gave birth to a child would also often give birth to a young crocodile. I quote, the family in which such a birth is supposed to have happened constantly put vittles into the river for their amphibious relations. Um, Hawkesworth didn't apparently realize that uh, crocodiles are not amphibious, but reptiles. Um, this kind of belief reportedly originated in southern Sulawesi, where, I quote again, the boogies, macassaries, and butons are so firmly persuaded that they have relations of the crocodile species in the rivers of their own country that they perform a periodical periodical ceremony in remembrance of them." End of quote. According to Hawksworth, this type of belief was also to be found among the, the non-Japanese Indonesian inhabitants of Batavia, many of whom probably came from southern Sulawesi, the island of Timor and Seram in eastern Indonesia, and among the people of Bengkulu in southern Sumatra. As was mentioned earlier, William Marston reported in roughly the same period from Sumatra that the indigenous population believed in consanguinity between humans and crocodiles. In a much later report, dated 1857, from the Civil Medical Service of the Netherlands Indies, the population of Banyuwangi, the eastern, uh, extreme eastern district of Java, was called very superstitious. They thought, for instance, that crocodiles originated from the human placenta. This was therefore thrown into the river with cake, flowers, and copper coins as an offering to the crocodiles. A few decades later, the Dutch ethnologist George Alexander Wilken wrote that there were many stories in the Indonesian archipelago of human females who had mated with crocodiles in human shape. 
their children could be either human or reptilian, and there was the possibility of twins, one of which human, the other one a croc. In the 1930s, the Dutch missionary Albert Kruijt, working in central Sulawesi, could still write that he knew several people, he personally knew several people, who were convinced they had a crocodile twin. Such a crocodile twin would help its human family members when, if called upon to do so. The Silat Kanda, a babat indigenous Japanese chronicle written around the late 18th century, but possibly containing older elements, mentions the marriage of a crocodile monarch and a human princess. The son of this couple led an army of his father's crocodile subjects to war against the rebellious Blambangan, Eastern Java and Bali, bringing these areas back under the authority of Majapahit, the classical state that dominated Central and Eastern Java during the 14th and 15th centuries. The ruler of the crocodiles could assume human shape. In one case, a very special case, that of the island of Timor, one of the lesser Sundas, we must assume that the human female married a crocodile in its animal shape. There is a series of references to this phenomenon starting in the 1770s. We are told that at the ascension of the th to the throne of a new monarch at Kupang, a virgin would be offered to the crocodile, which was believed to be the ancestor, also totem animal, of the ruler. At a gathering at the seashore, the crocodile would be summoned, one supposes by a crocodile charmer, and would appear without fail. Then the ancestor croc was offered the virgin, which was appropriately dressed and bedecked with flowers, but also tied up. And the crocodile would grab and drag the unfortunate maiden into the sea where the two were supposed to be married. When this took place in 1773, and the local VOC representative was told about it a few days later, he imposed a fine upon the king and his first minister. This first report by a French military engineer, Jean-Baptiste Pilon, is as close as one can get, can get to an eyewitness report. From the 1840s onwards, foreign visitors record that the sacrifice of a virgin to the crocodile used to take place on the island of Timor, but apparently it had been discontinued, probably because of VOC opposition. An early 19th century Dutch language source that explicitly mentioned the link between ancestors and crocodiles was based on experience in Java in the late 1820s. The Baron van Alva Rengers stated that the population of northern central Java addressed the crocodile as Baba Kyai, revered father, and that they thought that the souls of the ancestors resided in these monsters. Therefore, crocs would never attack a Javanese who had done him, them no harm. The Javanese did not hesitate to bathe in water where crocs were present, and there were seldom any incidents. However, Europeans, according to Van Alva Ringers, had only to enter the water to be grabbed by a crocodile, an opinion, an opinion often to be repeated in other European language sources. Earlier, I mentioned Le Grati in Eastern Java and its crocodiles when I talked about crocodile charmers. The people living around the lake in the 1840s and 50s thought they were related to the crocodiles. Here we find various explanations, one of them being that the crocodiles once had been people who had done something wrong and then had become the victims of a curse, thus turning into crocodiles. Another one, that the souls of people after their death migrated into those animals. That bad people could turn into crocodiles after their death was still believed in central Sumatra some 20 years ago, the 1990s, and for all we know, until today. In contrast to this, saintly people were also believed to turn into crocs after their death. The souls of those who had led an exemplary Islamic life could, after their death, migrate into a crocodile. An often cited example, dating from the 1890s, was Teunku Anjong, who turned into a crocodile, guarded the mouth of the river where his grave was situated, and kept bad crocodiles from entering the river of Aceh. Finally, there are many myths of origin of indigenous people in which humans, crocodiles, and tigers have an ancestral couple in common. One complicating feature has still to be mentioned, and that is that according to many people, not all crocodiles were related to humans. For instance, the Makassaris and the Buginis believed that only crocodiles with a tongue were family members. In the Poso area of central Sulawesi, the local population be believed that only crocodiles with five toes were related to them. Those with four toes were not. That is a five-toe crocodile. 
of this family. Um, So in the view of many South East Asians in the past, and doubtlessly also in the present, crocodiles and people are related in various ways. Some individuals, the were crocodiles, can assume either shape, which appears to suggest that both beings are more or less arbitrary appearances of one species. Nevertheless, as has been shown before, humans and crocodiles did and do not always see eye to eye. In the not-so-remote past, crocodiles killed people, their livestock and their dogs regularly. This was no doubt mainly or even exclusively perpetrated by the saltwater crocodile. But it evidently gave other crocs a bad name as well. Nowadays, with much lower numbers of crocs, the killing of people by crocodiles still occurs, but it has become rare. And can possibly be attributed to individual specialized man-eaters that have difficulties seizing other prey. However, if and when it happens, people are as upset as they used to be. How did people square this notion of the lethal marauder and the fear that the crocodiles inspired with the croc as a member of the family, the good crocodile, protector of the village, that should not be killed? The first line of defense of some indigenous person who would have been asked about this would doubtlessly be that, as we have seen, some crocs are family, while others are not. A close second would be that it was allowed to punish a crocodile that was guilty. If a crocodile, family or no family, had killed a human being or a domestic animal, those who had been wronged were permitted revenge. A crocodile charmer would be employed to summon the guilty croc, berate it for its crimes, and then kill it or announce at least its death sentence. After the death of the animal, the crocodile wizard would open its stomach, where he almost invariably found proof of the victim's guilt, an ornament worn by people or human hair. When a crocodile had been caught, the indigenous population would no longer show deference to the alleged murderer, family member or not. Otto Bonica describes the scene in Sumatra around the mid-19th century, where the local people release their pent-up rage by sticking the bite of crocodile wherever they can with sharp objects. On the Manet Peninsula, around the same time, a close relative of someone who had been grabbed by a croc was given a heavy machete to personally chop off the crocodile's head in revenge if a guilty croc had been captured. In Sumatra in the 1920s, a crocodile that had been captured and found guilty by means of the inspection of his stomach contents would be hacked to pieces. On the Mentawai Islands of, of Sumatra's west coast, around the mid-20th century, the guilty croc was even eaten after it had been captured and killed, and its skull was displayed on the wall of the house. Such scenes are being enacted even today, as is reported from Sarawak, Malaysian Borneo, where at the death of a man-eater in the early 1990s, the grieving relatives of its, its victim hacked the animal so badly that it was severely mutilated. Another way to give the potentially dangerous role of the crocodile a place in a worldview that seems to stress the relatedness of people and crocs is to view the crocodile killer as an institution to uphold customary law and to punish those who have breached it, either on the basis of its own authority as an ancestor or as an envoy of higher supernatural beings. If, therefore, someone is grabbed and killed by a crocodile, he or she must have done something wrong and has been punished for this by the ancestors. So being killed is really this person's own fault. This is explicitly mentioned for Sulawesi and Sumatra, but can probably be generalized for at least the entire Indonesian archipelago and possibly many areas of Southeast Asia. Folk tales are dead giveaways regarding mental coping mechanisms with dangerous situations. And the crocodile figures in many such tales in Southeast Asia. I have found them for Burma, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. The main motive in most of these tales is the crocodile as a dupe. Usually it is an unspecified monkey, or in some stories a tarsier, that plays tricks on the crocodile. In other stories it is the mouse deer that is the trickster, with the crocodile being duped, and sometimes the tiger as well. Occasionally, the folk tales show gullible crocodiles duped by people. 
Generally speaking, then, in all these stories, it is as if people are whistling in the dark. The message delivered by these tales appears to be that the crocodile is really a dummy, so there is no need to fear it. Finally, there is the notion that there is a pact between crocodiles and humans. This was already put forward by the German traveler Wilhelm Woltz, who published an account of his travels in the Gaio area, northern Sumatra, in 1912. He argued that people made a pact with the most dangerous animals around them. In the case of Sumatra, large snakes, crocodiles, and tigers. According to the principle, if you leave me alone, I will leave you alone. Such pacts also existed with gods and forces of nature, which were worshipped around the globe. In this way, the large predators became objects of veneration too, a state of affairs that was motivated by calling these animals ancestors or family members, totem animals of the wider kin group. However, this did not mean that people would not be glad to rid themselves of these dangerous relatives. Perhaps the notion of a pact grew stronger as the number of crocodiles started to drop, as did the number of deadly incidents caused by these animals. It stands to reason that people will be more inclined to think there is a pact that is really adhered to when there are fewer accidents. The notion of such a pact is not to be found in literature before 1912, and even then it is fairly rare. It may have been merged with another notion that is also absent in the literature prior to the 1930s that there used to be a war between crocodiles and people. This, so the story goes, led to so much killing that people hardly dared to leave their houses. So a pact was signed, and after that, the number of accidents dropped considerably. This idea of a war between crocs and people was, to my knowledge, mentioned for the first time by Albert Kracht for Central Sulawesi in the 1930s. And it was recently mentioned for the Iban in Sarawak, Borneo. Of course, the notion may be much older, but then it is strange that none of the older sources mentions it. During the 20th century, and particularly during the second half of that century, the relationship between crocodiles and humans in Southeast Asia shifted considerably. That is not to say that it remained unchanged prior to 1900. For instance, in Thailand, to the south of Bangkok, crocodiles were still common in 1778, but after 1800 they were no longer mentioned in traveler stories, almost certainly partly because the king of Siam had started to pay bounties for every crocodile killed. The crocodiles of Lake Limboto, northern Surabesi, appear to have been exterminated within a decade after the colonial government began to pay bounties for capturing animals, these animals in 1858. However, in Southeast Borneo, around the same time, no one wanted to kill crocodiles for the bounties alone. And in Poso, another area in Sulawesi, the bounty system was reported not to function very well as late as the 1930s. Be that as it may, around 1900, crocodiles were still very frequent visitors of most seashores, estuaries, rivers, and many lakes in Southeast Asia. Fatal accidents involving people were occurring rather frequently. One century later, the crocodiles had vanished from most of these areas, and the killing of human beings had become very rare, probably an activity undertaken only by a few specialized men-eating crocs. It is highly likely that the notion that crocodiles were relatives was instrumental in keeping the crocodile population at high density levels in many areas of Southeast Asia. This may have been particularly true in areas where animism, Buddhism, and Hinduism were dominant, while well, Orthodox Muslims and Christians might have been less inclined to harbor such beliefs. Although it has to be emphasized that many Muslims and Christians in Southeast Asia were not particularly Orthodox in those days. The notion that crocodiles were family is not easily explained unequivocally. One is tempted to see it as prima facie evidence that people felt close to crocodiles and that they were used to peaceful coexistence with these animals. I have quoted some evidence to the effect that occasionally local people appear to have lived peacefully in close proximity to crocodiles. However, it would be a mistake to ignore the possibility that calling a croc an ancestor was linked to the fear and rage inspired by the presence of that animal. The ancestor was reputed to help his human progeny on occasion, but he was also a stern taskmaster who would severely punish any infringement of customary law. The corollary of this was that someone who was killed by a crocodile was perceived as having deserved such a death. 
Calling the crocodile, revered father or grandfather, could also be seen as an attempt to flatter the animal, thus keeping it from harming the speaker. Much as many Indonesians called the terrible scorch of smallpox flowers or the beautiful disease. Thus, a case can be made that calling the crocodile a family member reflects feelings of apprehension rather than intimacy. Something similar applies to the notion of a pact between crocodiles and humans. You only conclude a pact with someone who is dangerous and has to be feared, not with someone with whom you feel at ease. However, this explanation does not imply that the stories about peaceful coexistence in specific instances are not to, believe, not to be believed. The two explanations can exist side by side. The notion of the crocodile's family, then, may have been one of the reasons that large-scale killing of crocodiles was rare prior to 1850, and in many places probably prior to 1900. The fact that many people were nonetheless killed by these ancestors just reinforced this perception. And as long as crocodiles were more or less ubiquitous, such beliefs were easily sustained, and some sort of balance may have been reached. It took a combination of bounties, a better market, and possibly higher prices for crocodile skins, the introduction of much, much better firearms and more non Southeast Asian hunters, the slow erosion of beliefs that crocs were family members, and the loss of habitat to make for rapidly dropping numbers of crocodiles. Now that humans have started to help crocodiles reproduce, a new chapter has begun and a new <coughs> equilibrium might be on its way. But the ancestral crocodile will probably disappear for good. Thank you very much.